This is a mostly new slide deck, rearranged a little bit, so I might get turned around just a little bit. But basically what I'm going to talk about is distributed systems. And I'm going to speak about distributed systems primarily in the context of REAC, which is a database. Um, I'm going to cover some architecture around like consistent hashing and some of the ideas behind why this is a distributed database and why you need something like that. I'm going to cover the, some of the features, such as intelligent replication, which is something where it, it auto-detects and determines how it needs to put data to make sure that if something, some part of the system, part, some part of the distributed system goes away, that you still have your data. Um, jump into uses and into clients, like how you would access a distributed database, because it's not usually just as straightforward as I'm going to connect to X thing and just magically have stuff work. Uh, a little background around React. It's made by Basho, who I do work for. Uh, Basho is named after a Japanese gentleman that is known for creating the haiku. Uh, some people have pointed out that he might not have been actually been the person who created the haiku, but it was thought that he was, and the person that named Basho named it after him. So that's why the company is called Basho. And one of the things they make is React. They also make React CS, which is an object store, another distributed system that works very, very similar to S3, which brings up the point. There's a lot of distributed systems out there, um, and there's distributed can be a little fungible sometimes. Sometimes people say, I have a distributed database, and what they mean is they have a, a database in one place and a database in another place. Um, in this particular context, what I'm talking about is distributed systems that are spread out across geographic areas so that if a part of the system is brought down, you still maintain access and the capability to retrieve and put information into this system. So, architecture. One of the main features that React uses, and some of the other distributed systems out there, they use different ideas and concepts around this, but it all kind of goes back to something that's very similar. We use a model called consistent hashing, or based on consistent hashing. And if you have a hash, it's just you know, the standard thing that you deal with whenever you're writing software, except that with a consistent hash, whenever you add or remove data, the keys don't have to be remapped to that data in a distributed system, or not all of the keys don't have to be. So like if you have a, a large hash table, and you start putting data in it, it, at a binary level, the keys are remapped. With a consistent hash, only a subset of the keys are remapped as the data is pushed back and forth into memory and such. Oh, now I'm out of sync. Oh, there we go. The other concept is that of a cluster, which a lot of people are probably very familiar with the idea of a cluster where you have more than one machine working together on a problem. In this context, the cluster is the distributed system. When you think of it as one thing, it has all these nodes inside of a cluster. So that's the second concept. And then there's the concept of a ring, which what we have in React is 160-bit key space. And I've drawn a ring just for visual effect here. Uh, when you're working with a ring, a consistent hash ring, in developer speak, you know, you, you're probably just dealing with it like a, a set of data or something <coughs> like that. But it's, easy to, it's a little easier to visualize it if you actually draw a ring and think of it like as a ring cluster or cluster ring. Um, so we have this key, this key space that we map the different partitions of a ring together in. And what this makes is you have physical nodes in this distributed system. And in this particular graph that I've shown here, I have four physical nodes, the nice lime green one, the super orange one, the periwinkle blue, and the hot pink. And the partitions are distributed across all those nodes on this ring so that each node gets a little bit of a certain part of the ring. And the ring is used to store the key space that I was talking about. 
And when you have this, this ring set up in a distributed system, what you want is your data to spread across the ring. And the way we do that with React is we write a replica of data. We attempt to make X number of writes that go into the ring. And then, as we were talking about with the nodes here, they're written to three different nodes. And even if there's a problem writing to one of the nodes, as long as some of the writes get across, a replica is attempted to be made so that you can confirm that there's three copies, no matter what, always within the system. So in a disaster scenario, which is why you want multiple copies, it might happen that our neon lime green went away. The machine died, you know, it, uh, for whatever reason, an earthquake happened, or somebody pulled the power cord out. Whatever the case might be, the machine is gone, it's out of the ring, we don't know where that data is. Well, the data is on two other nodes. So what happens is a fallback starts to occur, and the nodes intelligently replicate that data to a third, so that you always maintain those three copies. And this is usually in a distributed system, it's a configurable option. So you can say, I need X copies of data always to make sure that I have data integrity. Well, in this particular situation, it pops that down to the periwinkle blue node. Then let's say the node comes back and a handoff starts to occur and the periwinkle blue will give that data back up and put it back where it's supposed to be. So that way you always have your keys mapped to the appropriate space where that data is actually physically stored, whether it's in memory or it's on a physical drive or you know, some space age glass storage mechanism or something. Oh, that's great. So this is a ring we we're talking about. In React, one of the things that we do is we have our physical nodes and then we have what we call V nodes or virtual nodes. And within the ring here, you see that these, these are actually representing virtual nodes. So that you can have four physical nodes and you'll have X virtual nodes based upon your actual ring size. And the ring is again where key space is held. So in this particular situation, I've broken it out so that there's 32 partitions. So 32 partitions, four physical nodes, that means we're going to get eight virtual nodes on each, or eight, yeah, eight virtual nodes per machine. So, or did I just do that math totally wrong? Yeah, eight. So think of each one of these as the physical nodes, but this is the cluster ring around there. So when you read and write, that way it can always ensure that when you write out your, app, your replica, the data is not written to the same physical node, if at all possible. In some situations, if you've set your replica data to, I want three copies, or say you do more, or whatever the case is, but your physical node count goes below that replica set, sometimes you need something to write it to anyway, so things can still occur, such as writes or reads, and that's why you would have, that's why you have these virtual nodes, because then you can duplicate things on a single physical box if you need to, until you can recover and pull the physical nodes back into the distributed system. <clears throat> so what I've just talked about is the hinted handoff is the process where when one of the storage mechanisms or, or let's say this distributed system is a processing system, one of the physical machines that's doing the processing goes away, the hinted handoff knows how to intelligently move data or move processing to another system. Um, in the case of, like, say, Netflix, they use, um, why am I drawing a blank on this? Oh, Chaos Monkey, that's what it is. They use Chaos Monkey to run around in their infrastructure and basically just turn things off, just destroy them like they disappeared for whatever reason. Well, they use, like, a hinted handoff mechanism to either move data to where it needs to be to, in the, in the case of, like, CDNs, they say, okay, where's our library available for people to continue watching movies? it'll pop over to that other CDN where that library of content is stored, whether it's Game of Thrones or whatever they have. Um, so that's, that's one of the key 
concepts in a distributed system that it needs to be able to perform. It needs to be able to intelligently know where other data is to seamlessly move whatever's reading or writing to it to continue that without any interruption. Version conflicts. This is where things get tricky. Um, so a lot of the databases, again, in the academic space, there's a lot of thought around, well, how do you deal with version conflicts when you're trying to make it as transparent as possible? Because really, that's, that's what you get down to, is like, do you want the computer to be able to figure out what to do with it? You have to let it assume certain things, or do you just want to get your conflicts and do you want to deal with them? Like in the case of React, what we do is we use vector clocks. And what vector clocks do is kind of put a stamp on each piece of data as it goes through. And it's an identifier that helps the data be re-pieced by the system in an intelligent way. Or, based on configuration options, it can do like last, last right wins, where you just take whatever the last thing is that physically arrived, or assumed last right. In the case of vector clocks, you might get things actually out of the order in which you originally received them. And if that's the case, a vector clock can kind of determine time-wise which was the actual last one, and then it can take that and write it, or it can hand you the conflicts. And then your system, whatever it might be, whether it's you as a programmer or an operations person, can actually take a look at that data, or you can have a, uh, additional business rules information to handle the version conflict at that point. And in a distributed system, that, that's something that's fairly, you know, it happens fairly frequently because you're, you're dealing with like a massive data center over in X geographic region and then another one over like say East Coast, West Coast, primary example, right? Things will be received on either or end out of sync with one or the other data center. Like at Amazon with their e-commerce cart, every once in a blue moon, someone will have a cart and they'll be clicking through and they'll add something and something else will disappear for a second. Or, or it'll double is actually I think the way they, they tend toward the doubling versus the disappear thing because they want to make sure you have as many things as possible to buy. Um, <laughs> so you might get a double item, but then literally you just click refresh again or you add another item or anything changes where it causes a refresh and everything will sync back up and you'll have the appropriate set of data in your in your your basket to buy. Um, but that's, that's one of those situations where version conflicts absolutely come up all the time. The system just handles it really, really good, so barely anybody ever actually experiences an, oops, things have fallen out of my cart. Um, if anything, they magically replicate, like the replicator in Star Trek giving you too many hamburgers or something. So when you have version conflicts come up like that. One of the things, when, uh, as data's coming in and out, one of the things you want to be able to do is to continue working even if your node fails. And in a distributed system, you definitely need something like a, a re read repair type of mechanism. Whether it's an object store like S3, um, a key value store like React, or what, whatever the system may be. Because as you lose a node and add a node back, or even if you're not losing anything and just add another node, there's the likelihood that data gets out of sync and you need something to repair that, like a, basically a service that works actively in that system to manage the data and make sure things are not disappearing, make, making sure things are not duplicating, et cetera. So even in addition to handling version conflicts, a distributed system needs to be able to handle read repair whenever things come up. So one of the big theorems that buttons are hard, that is commonly talked about whenever you're talking about a distributed system is Eric Brewer's cap theorem. And uh, I totally need to say change what that says. I shouldn't write partitioning. But that basically is consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. In the case of partition tolerance, like if your network actually faults or some type of communication is, is altered at the network level, do, will you still be able to have your system maintain integrity of sorts? Availability is just having access to the data in a sense that you can read and write to it. 
And consistency is, uh, I think that's the most self-descriptive one, but basically like if you write something and then you read it, will it be consistent based on what you just wrote or will you get old data? Um, when you're working with distributed systems, this is kind of one of those, those triangle trade-off type mechanisms where you'll generally end up primarily stuck with two and you might be able to shift as you're working, but usually you get two out of the three. You, there's no known technology where you get all three of them all the time. Um, with React, for instance, we have settings where you can change how many writes or reads needs to occur to confirm that within the distributed system. So the consistency, you can, you can actually set it where the consistency might be a little off, but your availability is always there and it can survive heavy partitioning effects. So that's one of the things, if you want to learn more about distributed systems, this is a great starting point. Just read up on Eric Brewer's CAP theorem. And there is tons and tons of stuff and a giant massive wiki page and all sorts of good information out there about that. Uh, in the case of React, what we have is three key values. Speaking of the, the CAP theorem, that's n value, which is how many replicas the system is going to maintain responsibility for keeping. And then there's going to be reads and writes. Uh, the reads and writes are literally how many reads or how many writes the system will attempt to confirm and respond back and say, yes, this write is successful or this read is considered uh, the most consistent data. Here's the data. Um, in React, the way you can set these, like I was saying, and it changes your cap model. So if you said, well, I want my writes to be faster. Now remember the distributed environment. So if you say, I only want one write, because I don't really care. It's, not, it's just log data. There's a billion rows of stuff. And I, I just kind of want to get a basic trend off of that. You can bump the writes down to just one write. Do it real fast. Get it in there as fast as possible. Just boom, 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 boom. You might lose a few of the writes, because the system will say, well, one missed. Do you want to rescind it or something? It won't, you know, it won't really give the option for that. It'll just try to write it once, and then it's done. And then it'll replicate it out based on the end value. So it speeds up your writes, but you know, when it's confirming based off of just one attempt, you could lose things, and it would just say, oh, here's an error, and it would keep going. Um, but if you have it where it's set like on the default with React, where it attempts three writes no matter what, when it gets three writes to three separate nodes, it'll respond back and say, I have a confirmed write. This data is good. It'll be replicated out. And then it'll be replicated out based on the n value. That's not supposed to be there. <laughs> so in a distributed system, when you're doing writes, and reads, and you're looking at all these replica sets, the anatomy of any type of request is that you know you'll initiate the request which may be a read or a write just like you would in any other traditional type of system even like you know just a regular MySQL request you know you say hey I want to run this query run this SQL stuff here's the SQL and it'll it'll start acting upon that the difference in a distributed system is you'll take that and you'll say here I want this data here's my search parameters It'll take that and it'll say, all right, which virtual nodes are going to be responsible for running this? And it'll kind of, it'll, you'll, one of the virtual nodes will get that, okay? And you might have 50 bazillion virtual nodes, but one of them will receive that request and start to act upon that. And once it receives it, then it, it says, all right, how am I going to fulfill quorum decisions? I.e., like with reads, it's going to want three active nodes to actually respond and say, here's the data you requested. I'm confirming that it is accurate and up to date. So in that particular situation, you've sent it, and that's where things start to be different versus like a relational database, a traditional relational ba database and some other things like that, is because it'll actually have to look at it and say, all right, have I met quorum requirements? And then it hands off the data back to and says, yes, I've met my three rights. Here's your search uh, parameters and all the data that you have asked for back. 
So in the same thing with the uh, right. So some of the features beyond just like a, a core cluster um, of data that you would see like within a basically a data center or even within a rack. And sometimes in certain situations, you might even see all of this in one physical machine because it might have X number of like say blades in it or something like that where it's split out into physically segmented multi-tenant setup within itself is uh, multi data center replication or, or rack aware replication. <clears throat> and what that is, so you have these clusters that are distributed and they replicate data out, they replicate out writes and reads, and they do things like that to make sure that the, the data is written and can survive, you know, a zombie apocalypse or whatever it might be. But then, you know, you have the situation of, well, okay, in a data center or within a physical device or within a rack, you have a high backplane, you have known quantity when it comes to the network, you have known quantity when it comes to latency, et cetera. Well, between data centers, you don't have that. So there's things like uh, with React, it's multi-data center replication or MDC, where you can have full sync replication, where you have a source and a sync cluster, and they synchronize together. And the idea is that it's a feature of the cluster to know how to replicate data over an unknown uh, transport medium. Um, I shouldn't really say transport medium, but an unknown pathway in quantity, et cetera. Like one moment your connection might be a nice fat OC3 connection with really low latency, and then about 10 minutes into synchronization, it might all of a sudden appear to be something like a 28K modem that somebody just dialed up. Well, those types of features are often plugged into distributed systems. Like in the case of React, it's a, it's a subset feature that's available to connect to and run with React. This other slide is supposed to say real-time replication, not full sync replication. Real-time replication is like another feature subset where a client would attempt to write data or read data, and once it gets a quorum met and it actually writes that data or gets the read successfully, any change within the cluster would then be initiated and replicated out from that point forward. So some of the other systems, and this is something where I, I keep pushing, like just in, in the general community and conversation space, <clears throat> to kind of push forward the communication around like really dedicated, masterless, uh, distributed style systems, kind of like React where you have no master node. Everything is an autonomous entity unto itself. Um, there's other systems out there that work toward that goal. A lot of them focus around like platform as a service like Cloud Foundry and OpenShift. And then there's mesh networks. There's uh, things that kind of like the SETI network where everybody's processing, trying to figure out if we've actually spoken to or are speaking to aliens or whatnot. Uh, and the idea is, as we move forward in software development, it's ideal to build systems as distributed systems, even in smaller scale ways, because of <coughs> the way computers are changing at a fundamental level, at the multi-core tenant architecture, all the way up to multi-tenant physical racks, et cetera, et cetera, as it's split out between customers and whatever the the conversation I, I try to push forward is how do we make it more applicable to build distributed systems in an easy way? Like for years we've had systems where it's like, oh, here's, follow this how-to and you can build, here's your MySQL database, here's your app on top of that. You put it somewhere and it runs. But the minute you attempt to scale or grow or turn that into an ecosystem, it becomes exponentially more difficult and it has to eventually migrate, usually into some type of distributed system. Uh, prime example is Facebook, where it started out very small. It was connected to, uh, was it MySQL that they used a lot of? And it was just sitting there on top of it. But as it grew, they ran into obvious problems where, well, we can't keep sticking that much data into one database. We need to shard it out. We need to segment it. 
oh, we need something that's more of a key value store. We need to be able to store objects, et cetera. And we need it all distributed. We don't want to go down like that other social network. You know, we want to we want to keep our stuff running. Um, you know, it was a very very big push to have the system stay up like that. And what they did was they took a vertically sliced application and they started forcing it out sideways. And the conversation that I want to push forward and attempt to push forward more and more in the community is how do we help extend, mentor, and teach people how to build distributed more from the get-go versus here's the cookie cutter vertical slice, deal with the problems when you get there. Because it's not that hard to start with a little bit of an idea of scaling out horizontally versus only limiting yourself to a vertical uh, paradigm. Should have went to that one first. So the uses of distributed systems are, are, you can use them anywhere practically. You can use them on your own machine. You could use them uh, on the web. You can use them for processing, et cetera. One of, one of the coolest stories I heard about distributed systems was the fact that like uh, up at University of Washington in Seattle, they wanted to do various genomic studies. So they wanted to be able to process this data. They wanted to, to run queries against it. And they looked at their data sets and they said, well, uh, how can we do that? First thought, of course, is, well, throw it in a database. You can write queries against it, SQL queries. Well, when you have, at a small data subset, 4.3 trillion objects to look against, that's a problem. You can't do that anymore. You know, trying to index that, trying to just shove it into something and then write a query against it becomes pretty nuts. And um, they started looking at it, and they're like, well, we're going to try, we'll try this MapReduce thing. So they actually went to Amazon and started talking to Amazon about, how do, we, how do we query against this data? How do we make it logically set up so that we can query against it and actually get a result in a reasonable amount of time? And their reasonable amount of time was, well, you know, if we ran a query and it got back at the end of the day, we'd actually know something about that subset of data. So that would be cool. Well, they started working with them. And Amazon came back and said, well, what you could do is set up the data and just store it in whatever. That doesn't really matter too much because you just need it somewhere within AWS. And then you will use EMR, or Elastic MapReduce, to run queries against that data. So they did that. And because it was distributed and the data was broken out, and not sitting on a single machine trying to run a query directly against that one machine, they were actually able to get results in less than a minute, sub-minute response time for those basic subsets of data. That's one of the huge, huge reasons to use distributed systems right there. Because you know, one day computers might be fast enough to take one machine and go, yeah, I want to process all the genomic studies of blah, blah, blah the last 100 years. They might be able to do that. Great. Right now, they can't. So a distributed system like Amazon's EMR was perfect for their use case. So whenever they're doing these studies, every time they get a grant, they scale up the stuff. And they go, all right, we need you know, 500 big machines to process this stuff. And they start sending in their you know, MapReduce queries. And they get back their subsets, tons of them, per day. Whereas 10 years ago, if it was even feasible to do, they were looking at getting their results back, you know, like one result set back in a day. And now they get like 50 result sets back in a day. And they can actually do something and act on it much quicker, much sooner. So that's a, that's a pretty cool use case for distributed systems. I would say Facebook's a cool use case for it, but I, people might differ on me with that. It, it has its benefits, but it's pretty crazy too. Um, so clients, when you're connecting to a distributed system, one of the first things that, that is the instinctual thing to do is, oh, I'll just write an app, and it'll connect to this thing, and it'll pull back data. Well. That, that doesn't work if you have 500 nodes. How do you know which node has the data? How do you know which node might be able to find the data or you know, th those types of things? There's a lot of intelligence built into the system, especially like in React, the node would know, OK, I don't have this data. Start, you know, start asking down the line until we get a confirmation. And then it'll go out, and it'll link walk, and it'll find the data, and it'll get the data back for you. But 
you know, there's, there's not always this assumption. And also at the networking level, you have all these physical nodes and they're load balanced per se, or whatever magic someone might have set up. Usually they're load balanced or they have some type of intelligent way to communicate. One client model is literally for the clients to keep track and do the load balancing themselves, which is an interesting way to approach this. The other thing is to have the network system load balance it at a high-end router level. So if you have 50 nodes, it load balances between all those and you can use a single IP or like a, a DNS CNAME reference to route all the traffic that then is round robin to all the nodes and the nodes can respond and interact in that way. But uh, that's, that's one of the situations where it, it does definitely make it a little harder to um, build a distributed system because you don't just sit down and say, I'm gonna connect to it now. You have to sit down and say, all right, what model do I want to use to connect to this system? Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's, the, that's the overarching coverage of distributed systems. Um, and hopefully it was fairly informative. And I hope everybody thinks about how we as a community and an industry can make it easier to build things in a distributed sense. Um, and hopefully we can not be stuck in a vertically designed world anymore. So that's, that's pretty much it. Hope it's pretty interesting. If anybody's got any questions, um, I'm here now and I'm around Portland and I'm on Twitter. Uh, so you can always scream at me on Twitter and I'll, I'll answer all sorts of stuff on Twitter. Yes? So what's the largest uh, data set and or number of servers that React is uh, okay, two, two questions. What's the largest number of nodes? I think around, I'd say 80 plus. Uh, with the covet that usually what's done with React is um, the individual nodes of the cluster get bumped up from mere pizza box size to a more substantial system. So even though it's a horizontally scaled system, it's actually much easier to start bumping up hardware at some point and to keep the node, the node count a little bit smaller just because your communication stays easier, there's less background clutter. Um, you start getting into the you know, more uh, nodes, you get more background clutter and you have to really, uh, it gets more cost prohibitive to build up back-end structures to manage this back-end noise um, than it is to just get slightly bigger machines and deal with it in that sense. So in uh, one of our larger ones, I don't, I don't even remember what the, the, drive away, the drive arrays were pretty huge. And I'm thinking <coughs> probably 100 terabytes inside of a machine or something like that. Uh, kind of a RAID setup so that it was easier like when a node, if it did fail, it would e be easy to um, just kind of swap drives and really get it back up as soon as possible. Um, so that's the, that's the biggest like cluster size. Now as, as far as data, uh, I was just talking to somebody about that just a few minutes ago and we're hitting really, really close to exabyte sizes. So that's pretty substantial. <laughs> Usually I say that I still think, I'm like, am I making up goofy words again? Um, but it's the, it's the right above petabyte. So we, and we have quite a few systems out there that are petabyte or real close to petabyte. And I mean, that's, that's substantial. You know, not very, very few entities actually get to that size or even close. Um, it's very common to see single clusters in a data center hit, you know, easily dozens and dozens of terabytes, if not a couple hundred terabytes. And even that, that's a, you know, that's a substantial subset of data too. But we have seen way, way up in the petabyte, close to and soon to be exceeding exabyte size data, which is just still boggles my mind. Yeah. So this is disk based? Um, what do you mean disk based? Well, you're talking exabyte size, I'm assuming this is not all in memory. No, it's not in memory. I, I wish, I don't know if it, an entity on earth could afford that much memory. Yeah, <laughs> I'm hitting about a terabyte of memory. Yeah. I don't have anywhere near that much disk. 
I think I don't I don't know what as far as React is a totally open source database. So even though Basho makes it and I work for them, the only customers we know about are the customers that actually you know, have a reason to talk to us or want to buy one of the peripheral subsets of features like the multi-data center replication or something. So there's a lot of people out there with single clusters in a data center that, you know, who knows how much <coughs> they're, they're doing. I mean, you know, if they have a really skilled team, they, they don't ever actually have to come talk to us. <laughs> you know, they can just do whatever they want to. Um, but as far as customers that I know of and, and have talked to or am aware of the, the things that they're doing, I know one was dealing with, I think, like 100 and 12, 12 terabytes of memory within the cluster itself as a resource. And they push, they push their key space into memory, which makes it stupid fast. Um, but of course, you know, that many terabytes of memory was not cheap. But they, they got it, they configured it, and it works really, really well for them for what they're trying to do. So, so React can be, you could force this whole thing into memory based. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, so I'm using coherence. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, I'm just curious. Yeah. Re React at its, at its core, oh, there goes words being overloaded again. So, we have a thing called React Core. And again, it's one of the open source libraries there. And everything in React is actually based off of React Core. <coughs> and what that is, it's an Erlang library that helps you set up an uh, Erlang project to build a distributed Erlang app, um, whatever that might be. In the case, in our case at Basho, is we use that as the base template to get started building React, uh, React Cloud Storage, which is an object storage version of the key value database. Um, and other people have gone, cloned it, and gone to town building you know, internal systems or whatever. So React's basis design principle is that it's a distributed system. The fact that it's a key value store or an object store is actually a secondary design consideration because the back end can be swapped out. And if you want to you know, add a new back end to it, you can totally do that. In, in our case, the two key ones that we use are BitCask and LevelDB. In the case of BitCask, you actually, like the, the, the key space actually has to be stored in memory in that particular one. Um, and you can mix and match the backends too based on the buckets of data throughout the system. So if you want to use BitCast for one to have that fast seek access with the in memory, or if you want to use LevelDB because it has secondary indexes to, to kind of you know, enhance and give, you, give yourself a little bit uh, more query capability to look for keywords and things like that, you could actually do that and have two subsets of data between two buckets. Um, it's config almost everything in here that I talked about is configurable per bucket. It kind of ex exists as an entity to give you that option and flexibility. No. Go ahead. That's okay. Well, I know one of the reasons people will use a traditional RMDBS is for the asset compliance ability. Right. And now this doesn't follow that. It's more. It follows like a base style. With that, oh yeah. It's eventual consistency. Yeah, I had to I had to think about that for a second. Okay. Yes, it, it's so an eventually consistent system. Like I, I would not want to do transactions or things like transactions in there. Um, from a client side, I mean, you can use a unit of work model and kind of follow through things and do pseudo transactions, but it gets really tricky. Um, tra transactions are still one of those things that tends to stick to relational data models and the, the existing, whatever we call them, legacy or the databases that have been around for a while, just because they do so that, that well. I mean, it, it will always eventually hit the same consistency point across all the nodes, there's no... Yeah, and the in value, <laughs> which would create replica sets, would eventually do that. And the, the same thing works in other distributed systems where there's like processing or queuing for processing, where you want X things to confirm data uh, it would be replicated out to that, and that many things would be working on X problem, um, the same way that you would think of the, the data itself. So, yeah. Thank you. And if anyone wants to stay, you know, after. Cool. After the development, so, but thank you.